after the true Salahuddin went back to Damascus. And the narration mentioned that one wet day he went to visit the Hajis. And when he came back, it was cold, it was wet. He became ill. And every day his state got worse. And Ali Maad mentioned, I was with Salahuddin when he was ill. He says, he says, by Allah, every time Salahuddin became more ill, it was as though his trust in the Rahm of Allah just increased. He said, the weaker his body got, the stronger his trust in Allah became. And even in that state, Salahuddin couldn't go to the masjid anymore. But he insisted on praying Salah with Jama'ah. And they would bring an Imam. They would help him up and he would pray Salah in Jama'ah. On the ninth day, Salahuddin became unconscious. And Shaykh Jafar mentions that I was reciting the Quran by his bed. And when I reached the verses, Wallahu la ilaha illahu alimul ghaybi wa shahada. He is Allah and no Lord besides Him, the knower of the unseen. He said, Salahuddin had been unconscious for a while. And I heard a faint voice saying, Sahih, you have spoken the truth. And he mentioned, for three days I recited the Quran by the bed of Salahuddin. And he said, on the final day when he passed away, I reached the verse, La ilaha illahu alayhi tawakkaltu. There is no God but Allah and upon Him I trust. And I saw Salahuddin's face become radiant and he recited the Shahada and he left this dunya. And Ibn Shaddad mentioned that this was the greatest calamity to befall the Muslims since the demise of the Khulafai Rashidun. Ibn Shaddad mentions that many times I had heard the saying that I wish I could die on this place. And I always thought that this was an exaggeration. But he said, I realized the reality of that statement when Salahuddin passed away. He said, I wish I could have died on the place of Salahuddin. And Abdul Latif, the famous physician says that he was mourned like a prophet because everybody loved him. The good loved him, the bad loved him, the Muslims loved him, the non-Muslims loved him. Everybody loved Salahuddin. And what did this king leave behind him? King of Egypt, King of Syria, Lebanon, Yemen. What did he leave behind him? He left one dinar and 47 dirhams, some armor and a horse. This is all he left behind him. They had to borrow money for his janazah. But I'll tell you what he left behind him. He left a legacy behind him. He left a legacy behind him. And this is why we are gathered here today. He passed away at the time of Fajr and after Zohar they brought his body out. And the narrations mention that people screamed and cried as though the whole dunya had just become one place. And many people when they saw his dead body, they couldn't believe it. They became unconscious. They didn't attend the janaza because they couldn't, they couldn't believe that Salahuddin had passed away. The liberator of the holy lands. And how was Salahuddin buried? They had to borrow money for a janazah. And Qadi Fadil gave a fatwa that Salahuddin should be buried with his sword. So that on the day of judgment when he's resurrected, and one of the seven people who is under the shade of Allah is Imamun Adilun, a just ruler. When he's under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is leaning upon his sword. So everybody sees. That this is the liberator of the holy lands. And on his tomb, they wrote. Because this was the man who liberated. This was the man who flung open the gates of fortresses and castles of the Christians. One after the other. And on his tomb, they wrote. Oh Allah, as his final victory, open for him the gates of Jannah. Open for him the gates of Jannah. And my dear respected brothers and sisters listening at home. Salahuddin is one of you know, the greatest heroes of Islam. And this is why we have gathered here to remember this. But the problem with many Muslims has become today, or with all Muslims, is that we live off our legacy. You know, as a poet says, he said, the Muslims come to the grave of Salahuddin and they come again and again. And what do they do? They stand by the grave of Salahuddin and they say, Qum ya Salahuddin, Qum. Oh Salahuddin, stand, stand up, oh Salahuddin, we need you. Can't you see what's happening in Iraq? 
Can't you see what's happening in Afghanistan? Can't you see the supine, spineless leaders that we have? Oh Salahuddin, we need you to liberate the holy lands. The poet says, they come. And they say, قُمْ يَا صَلَاحَدِينَ قُمْ حَتَّى إِشْتَكَ مَرْقَدُهُ مِنْ حَوْلِهِ الْعَفُونَ He says, they come to his grave and they say, Oh Salahuddin, stand, stand. Until his grave began to complain about the stench around it. And the poet says, كَمْ مَرْعَةً فِي الْعَامِ تُوْقِذُونَهُ كَمْ مَرْعَةً عَلَى الْجِدَارِ الْجُبْنِ تَجْلِدُونَهُ أَيَطْلُبُ الْأَحْيَاءُ مِنْ أَمْوَاتِهِمْ مَعُونَ He said, how many times in the year are you going to wake Salahuddin up? He said, how many times are you going to whip Salahuddin for your own cowardice? And then he says sarcastically, أَيَطْلُبُ الْأَحْيَاءُ مِنْ أَمْوَاتِهِمْ مَعُونَ He said, has it come to the state that the living have started asking the dead for help? The living have started asking the dead for help. Nobody aspires to be a Salahuddin. Nobody tries to be Umar ibn Khattab or Abu Dhar or Abu Bakr or a Khadija or a Fatima. Nobody aspires to be like them. We live off our legacy. You know, we remember these people, but none of us aspire to be like them. We can't be cowardice because we believe in a hereafter. You can't celebrate the life of Salahuddin and Umar ibn Khattab and then be cowardice yourself. Mm-hmm.